I just finished binge watching this, like all good Netflix products, and I am so excited to talk to you guys about this show. I'm so excited. You are committed. Yes. It's only been up for not even 24 hours. I, I think I was like people were following me in the door. I was <laughs> I was there so quick. Um, I loved it from the minute it started. Really, the, that's good. Yeah, that's the good music was amazing. The and the locations are fantastic, and the characters and your okay headlining the show is just amazing. <laughs> Just, you do such a great job of bringing people into this thing and making people feel comfortable and teaching them things. I'm a sort of ambitious, aggressive home cook, and I thought I would know everything that was you know, being imparted by you delightfully, and I learned a lot oh, of things. That's so amazing to hear. Yeah. Thank you. So, so I want to know how you chose the locations and the subjects and the characters that you chose. Maybe we start with um, Japan and um, one food source that I didn't know was a big part of the Japanese culture was salt. Yeah. Um, well, it all was kind of a matrix that we had to figure out together because it was we made the show sort of pretty rapidly all in a row. So it, you know what I mean? It was like a beautiful mind moment with a one million puzzle pieces that were constantly moving. So Japan didn't happen in a vacuum because for a while we were going to go to Italy for salt. Yeah. So it all had to do with seasonality and availability and who we could find. But since the beginning, I had such a strong feeling that Japan would be such an amazing place to visit to explore the element of salt because in Japanese cooking, there's so many different kinds of salt used on a daily basis. Soy sauce, miso, pickles, and also salt, which also, I agree with you. I didn't know that there was a great tradition of salt making in Japan either. 4,000 varieties? Yeah, I mean, it was, isn't that crazy? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was bananas. Yeah, You can just set up a business by siphoning water from the sea and then, and then drying it. Right, and squeezing out <laughs> seaweed. Yes. Right? Yep. <laughs> there, it was really it's, remarkable there, and I think, the, they had told us that the government had deregulated actually the salt making industry in the last, I think, maybe 10 or 15 years. And so because of that, all of these little artisanal salt makers have popped up, just a one man show, two man show. So we actually got to meet this amazing person who, um, he does exactly that. He siphons water out of a bay at high yeah. tide and then runs it through this sort of filtration evaporation process to get it, the water pretty concentrated. And then he takes it um, to his home where he has this basically wood powered bath where he evaporates it a second time and very carefully um, sh creates these flakes, these most delicate, like light as snow flakes of salt. And he's, um, he's the husband of the woman who taught me how to make miso. So it's, it's a very in the family. Like once we led, were led to one person, then that would lead us to the next person. So often it started with a connection that I had, but you know, sometimes we ended up with characters that we could have never imagined finding. Right. Um, and the expatriate that was in the, in the first ep the salt episode, um, she was a home cook, right? Mm -hmm. So that was another great touch, was that you found people who were, you certainly used you know, professionals, but there were also, you also looked to home cooks to help you. Experience. Yeah, I think for yeah. me, I am very much a champion of home cooking and home cooks, and there are so many food shows, really beautiful ones that exist to elevate professional cooking and professional chefs, right. but there aren't that many that really celebrate home cooking or are for home cooks especially. And I wanted to do that both in, you know, with the content, with the characters, at, at every level. And Caroline was a really good force because sometimes I would slip into professional mindset and she'd be like, is that really what someone would do at home? You know, and so she was, you, you keeping me real for sure. Especially when I started cleaning other people's houses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that I mean one of Samin's like most powerful messages is that anyone can learn how to cook. Yeah. So we didn't want to go to these places where they had sous vide machines and you know crazy tools. We wanted to really show that you know around the world, everyone kind of cooks the same way. Yeah. In certain and I actually noticed it in the in the episodes because, like all good Netflix products, you have to watch the whole thing in order to really get it. Um, and the um, and the way you moved from when you did get a little esoteric in terms of the the, the food, the salt, especially the salt is yeah, what I'm thinking that was of the with the, the miso, mm -hmm. um, was that you returned it so well 
back in a home cooking experience with somebody who had no home she knows cooking, nothing. yeah, at all <laughs> about food. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, though lovely, of course. Um, and I thought that was great control of, uh, you know, of a food show's message is uh, mm -hmm. you, something you don't often see. The temptation to move into the esoteric and show off a little bit is considerable mm -hmm. on food shows. Yeah. And you guys really had, you know, great discipline. Um, yeah. We wanted it to be rooted in kind of Samin's message and in the in, and in regular kitchens. So yeah, it was very it was very well done. Um, and characters in the you know beautiful locations um, in Italy and in and in Japan, um, but characters as well. Absolutely. Um, and you know and and adventures the 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 episode that's about fat um, is great because it's about animal fat and vegetable fat in the form of olive oil and also dairy fat. Um, but you get you get the the, the pig um, disassembling. <laughs> Um, scenes and they're and they're great and they're beautifully shot. Um, I love the the uh, I don't, what's the technical word for when you shoot above the table? You yeah. got the, well, you can call it tabletop. Yeah. Tabletop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the 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 cut to the to the disassembled pig and then the descriptions of the parts and their uses and also choices that you have to make mm -hmm. when you're when you're when you're taking apart one pig, you don't get to do everything you want. Um, I'd love it if you talk about. Sure. I mean, Lorenzo, the butcher who, who, you know, really invited us into his butcher shop and onto his farm, and he was so passionate about these animals. And he had, I think, I don't remember, since the 1800s or 1600s, his family has raised this variety of pig. And he's, I don't know, eighth generation butcher. You know, it's, it's incredible, the history for him. So for him, there is, um, he thinks about that tradition every time he makes a decision and that is about cutting. So, you know, if you're gonna make the choice to, if you wanna make dinner out of your pork, <laughs> right, you're gonna cut it a different way than if you wanna preserve all of the fat on there so that you can cure it and turn it into a prosciutto or a piece of uh, pancetta or lardo. So there are different decisions that you make based on what it is that your ultimate goal is, which I think is reflected throughout all cooking. And my goal as a teacher is to help you understand how to make those decisions. Yeah. There are like little revelations. I mean, when we were filming with the pigs, Samin said, um, and Lorenzo said, oh, the legs get the most work because they're walking around all the time. Rather, and so they are the most muscular and have the least fat, whereas the belly, you know, yeah. has the most fat. So, you know, you don't, I don't really, I'm a, I'm a big home cook, but I didn't know, I'd never thought about meat in terms of animals and their bodies in the same way. So, it's great, and there's yeah. so much work involved when you yeah, set there's... about taking apart. Thing. They did it pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. They I did. mean, he's a master. He does it every day. And so it was really beautiful. It was very almost symphonic watching him. Like, he was able to do it in the fewest amount of cuts. And that's one of the things I really love about European style butchery is that it's not about the hacksaw, you know, and the um, like electric saws and stuff that just cut sort of willy nilly down. It's so much more about the poetry of being familiar with the joints and with the bones and being able to follow that so you get the maximum yield. And it's much more sort of a natural way of butchering. So even that moment when the side of the uh, the half of the pig is hanging and he sticks his knife in there to just disassemble the prosciutto and just it, and it comes off, yeah. that is such a masterful move, and I love that we were able to capture that. Yeah, it was beautiful, and the and and the knife is more the size of a pen. Yeah, really. it's not you. Know, it's not about a huge knife at all. Yeah, yeah it's about knowing how yeah. to use it. And it's not about an expensive knife. Or no, his dad. His dad was basically this little elf who it was so adorable. Who, like, I, at one point I took out my own knife roll, and I don't have like the most fancy or expensive knives, but I think to him they appeared to be really fancy. And um, and he was like, listen, it's not about the size of your knife. <laughs> it's not about the cost of your knife. It's about how you use it. And I said, yes, I agree. I know. But <laughs> they were. <laughs> heard that. Though. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> now, you mentioned pickles in the first, um, when we were talking just now um, about salt, but one of the other you know, things that I liked so much about the show was that you, that, that it was all very intertwined, um, that, because pickles show up again in the, in the, in the third in acid, ep yeah. in episode, in, the, in the acid, which is another great um, treatment of the subject, and also not 
the first location I would go to talk, talk about acid. I don't know exactly what the first location is, but I was really ple pleasantly surprised to find this whole other access point to Mexico. Yeah, well, we actually almost went to Iran, where my family's from, yeah. because the palate of our cooking is so acidic. And we use so many really sour ingredients in Persian cooking, pomegranate molasses, sour oranges, so many tart yogurts and cheeses and things. And I really wanted to explore that. And at the last minute, it just didn't make sense for us to go there. So we had to shift gears and we were like, where should we go? And I am from San Diego. I grew up eating Mexican food. And in my mind, that had always been the next place in line right. to go to explore acid. But you know, like there are a lot of logistical reasons why we make decisions. And Netflix had just put out a couple of shows that had episodes in Mexico City. And so they said, you can't go there. You have to figure out where else to go. And we did a little homework and found out that the sour oranges, the same ones that we were going to visit and study in Iran, mm -hmm. through the spice trades, had made their way to Mexico, to the Yucatan, and were this in integral ingredient in Yucatecan cuisine. And so it was this kind of beautiful poetry that we got to visit the same ingredient in a completely different right. place. Did they did they come through the spice route through Spain? I think through India, yeah, through the Moors to Spain and then to Mexico, yeah. Right. Wow. It's the Seville orange is what it's called a lot oh, in okay. English. So yes, through Spain. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, w you guys worked together to, to from the beginning to put this show together was yeah well we had a team of producers who are amazing and great and they and you know we all worked together we studied Samin's book and thought okay how do we turn what is essentially a cookbook I mean it's more than a cookbook but it's you know it is a cookbook and turn it into kind of stories and weave them together and also it is so layered right. because a lot of the ingredients or salty and acidic or so how do we make all how do we distill her most basic and useful lessons right. and turn it into a TV show. So it was a whole team of people who did that and it was very fun and it is like a matrix. You're trying to, you know, because you want the series to be varied enough. You right. don't want, and we also, you know, Europe, we watch so much food TV and there's a lot of stuff about Europe, which is great, but we kind of wanted to go and with people who weren't the usual suspects, right. so. So you, were, so you did lots of research but, yes. in anticipation of this. Yes. And, and what were some of the goals that, I mean, you watched all the, all the food television, and of course mm -hmm. you loved all of it, but there were some things that mm -hmm. you chose not to do. What were you looking to do, um, you know, what, what, I mean, besides being honest, uh -huh. you know, being honest to the book, what were you looking to, what were you looking to do differently than you, that had Well, I think done? we wanted it to be, I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, food television, which is obviously beautiful, but we want it to be incredibly beautiful. And my background isn't in food. I'm a documentary filmmaker, so I kind of brought that perspective to it as a lay person, not a food person. Right. You know, I, I imagine what would I get out of this watching this? And also, it's really bringing Samin as a very unusual character. <laughs> in, in lovely ways, in wonderful ways. And we wanted to bring her spirit to life. I mean, that's why, um, I mean, Netflix fell in love with her when they met her. Right. Jigsaw, the production company, fell in love with her. So we wanted to take that kind of energy that she has and bring it to the screen. Because I, you don't see that many women who are out there well, harvesting seaweed and Yeah, and that was one of the things that I was curious yeah. about was that, you know, to have a woman doing the, you know, running the adventure is a great and welcome change for yeah this was television. definitely a lady run project yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah sorry. sorry it was not by mistake you know and it was definitely intentional both behind the camera and in front of the camera the choices that we made to you know make something that's different i think there is a lot of great food tv out there but a lot of it's the same and so i to me i thought well this is my one shot maybe i'll never have another chance to do this so what am i going to do with this i want to honor home cooks. And who are home cooks? They're almost always women. Mm -hmm. And those people don't really ever get any credit. Those people don't ever get to be shown on TV in, in a beautiful, in like cinematic beauty, you know? And I mean, Caroline, like, I, I don't know if you've always been obsessed with this or if you were just during when we were making it, but I Am Love, 
Yes. The Luca yeah. Guadagnino movie. Uh, is that how you say his name? Um, I, I don't know. So. Yeah, I don't think um. so, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't correct you because... Forgive me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it was this like beautiful... It's the same director who made um, uh, Call Me By Your Name. Right. And it's this uh, sort of beautiful northern Italian love... It's like a, it's like a love letter to Italy. And I think that was a big inspiration mm -hmm. for you in making this episode that's a love letter to my Italy, to the Italy that I got to live in. And so things like that that would have never occurred to me, you know, that's the kind of stuff that Caroline brought to it was this sort of larger cinematic vision, these inspirations. It was really cool. And I was I was very excited to see you use you speaking other languages. It was um, exciting and, to get to, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's a big part of it is to not roll in and use English as the, as, you know, the first w method of communication to, to really speak the language well, or try, you know? I mean, yeah, um, ja Japan, I was definitely limited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of smiling and yeah. nodding in yeah, Japan. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that kind of sensitivity to, to you know, to going into a situation and, and not taking it over is a, is a very um, positive yeah, I mean, that's also just who I've been my whole life yeah. is a person who, you know, slips into situations and communities and does my best to fit in and make people feel comfortable. So in a way, that's a skill that I've been honing my whole entire life. And I didn't actually even realize how useful it would be until we were doing it. And I realized, oh, I happen to be really comfortable in front of the camera, but there are a lot of things I'm learning about. I'm learning that there's all these people moving back there and I, it's my job to ignore them. Or right. we have to stop and do things multiple times and it might feel like I made a mistake, but I didn't actually make a mistake. Huh. We're doing it multiple times because they need a different angle. Or maybe I did make a mistake, but that's okay. And so once I got a hang of that after a few days, I realized it was then my job to explain that to everybody who I came in contact with because certainly those people had never done it either. Right. And in order for them to be their most comfortable with me and may help make the best television, I, I wanted to explain that so they could be at ease. You know, don't worry when we have to do it 20 times. It's not your fault, it's okay, it's just part of the process. Right. We know how uncomfortable it is being in front of a camera. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and we're going to do this 20 I times. I always am very empathetic whenever I have to do anything like this. Because so, when you, so when you went back to San Francisco, one, I have one controversial question to ask you. Oh, yeah. You, um, do. Was the, when you chose the grocery store to use oh, as yeah. the set. Uh -huh. for, for, or the I background know. for um, you know, uh, your sort of uh, pro tips for shopping. Uh, why didn't you choose the co-op? Which, wait, what, <laughs> what, we don't have a co-op in Berkeley. I live in Berkeley. Well, you didn't go across the bay to Oakland and go to the Oakland co-op? No, well, I live in Berkeley where um, the big grocery store in the East Bay is Berkeley Bowl. Yeah. And so the big co-op in San Francisco is Rainbow. Rainbow, But right. Yeah, Rainbow, right. and so, but Berkeley Bowl has so much more produce. And so, <laughs> but the thing I love about that store, and we, like, I had to convince these guys that it wasn't too fancy, yeah. is mm -hmm. that Berkeley Bowl is kind of just has some of everything. So, yes, you get your, like, organic whatever, but then they also have Best Foods mayonnaise. And so it's, it's, it's the whole spectrum mm -hmm. of of options are available and I know you know especially in the winter in like Minnesota you're not going to see that variety of produce right. <laughs> but we also chose to talk about broccoli and cauliflower and carrots and Brussels sprouts instead of you know all of the heirloom varieties of things for a reason so every choice that I made about what to cook and what to talk about was really with an idea of how will this reach and land with the greatest number of people and really speak to them. Right. The last episode is meant to bring all of these lessons and all of the travel back home and say, okay, how do you really cook when you're in the United States? How do you really cook when you're faced in, with choices in a supermarket? And, right. And, yeah. and, and an interesting thing about that is that really when we, we talk about American cuisine, we, we're, we don't have a cuisine so much as we are a nation of immigrants. And we have, we, you, we pick and choose our different um, uh, ingredients and our, you know, the our themes, our based cooking, on heritage, things, our food ways, right? Totally. Um, and and that that was a great thing to be able to go out into the world and then come back and make short ribs. Yeah, and, and, and apply and, it to and like roast rice, chicken, chicken, vegetable mm -hmm. salad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was very convincing that if you were somebody who was launching themselves on the project of really mm -hmm. getting serious about cooking or becoming curious about cooking. Um, that 
this show would be one that, that you you'd see the possible, you know, and yeah. and be excited about what the outer edges yeah. of you know yeah. that. Would, I mean, just for me, if I, I used to be such a recipe follower, I'd say, oh, I don't have creme fraiche, I can't make this. Or else I have to run out and go get creme fraiche. Like, I would be so, uh, such a stickler for following the rules. And now, because of working on this project and doing, reading the book, I, I'm free. Yeah. I'm, but no, but it really is, it's so much more relaxing to cook that way. Well, you, get, you have to get 199 pages into that book before you say, now you're ready to cook, and then there, there are recipes. It's a, I mean, it's clearly a very intentional thing, and it's, and it's reflected in, in the show. Um, th there are no recipes in the show. No. no there's no mention of measurements. Um, mm. uh, but and there that is was a, intentional. Yeah, and, and, and it's, a great, it's a great way of, I, I, in the book I think that you talk about, I don't remember which chef you credit with this, but that the recipe is sort of a starting place mm -hmm. um, and that it should be used as uh, a photograph, you know, yeah. um, and, and that, ev that you have to be present in the process and know that chili is the same as ragu and that, that, and that, that kind of um, preparation is repeated in cuisines across Exactly. The world, and yeah. you just have to get with it in terms of, you know, the, what ingredients. I always joke that there's only seven recipes in the world. Yeah. Like, there's only seven ways of cooking things, yeah. and it, everywhere you go, you, there's just variations of those things. What and are so, they, though? I don't know. See, that's that your next book. <laughs> 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 there's, there's a sandwich, right? There's a sandwich everywhere. A sandwich. There's, there's, a, there's a sauce. Mushu right? pork yes. slash pork. burrito. Yeah. No, like a burrito. Yeah. 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 Um, that's your next book. Okay, got it. Thanks. The seven <laughs> things. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that 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 should give people um, should comfort people and give people confidence that really you're just going to make the thing that everybody's always been making the whole time, and what you're just going to do is be present. I have people yeah. in my life who really are when they put the like you were talking about mm -hmm. when you put the recipe down, you're like, okay, yeah. you know, do I have everything I need? And in truth, salt, fat, acid, heat. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's extra pressure people don't need when they get home and they're exhausted and they've just worked a long day right. to yeah. have to feel like you have to do something perfectly. Yeah. So. And, and, and you know, I mean, the, 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 food in, the food industry is built up around, is, is aspirational, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. prime, you know, at, sort of, I think it was probably, it became aspirational. 10 years ago. I think it's, certainly over the course of my cooking career, yeah. perfectionism in cooking in, in the like image of culin the culinary world has um, really proliferated. And the idea that like dinner needs to be some perfectly plated thing with two vegetables and a meat, or you know, the dinner can't just be a plate of scrambled eggs and toast. Right. You know, I think our idea of what it means to cook, up, cook at home has um, gotten a lot more complicated and my goal is to simplify it again. And so for me, with the show, all I hope for is that it inspires people to cook, you know, to feel like they can do it. And if you, you know, at, at the end, my friend told me recently, she said, oh, at the end of episode four, like, I had a tray of cauliflower in the oven before the show was over. So I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Where is that cauliflower? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that the, I think that it was headed in that direction. I think it was headed dire that direction anyway. But Instagram certainly, mm -hmm. you know, put accelerated that process. That this is something that you need to be able to demonstrate to strangers that you're able to do, or you're yeah. you know, close, your nearest and dearest. Um, um, can we talk about tools a little bit? Because that was um, one of the th themes through the, and actually, you, you didn't really hit this note too hard and I, uh, and that was notable people usually talk about the knife that you know they can't live without and that wasn't the case um, but you had the mortar and a pestle um, in three of the four I think. yeah mm -hmm. um, I think maybe and, all of them and I guess it, it was yeah. remarkable for me because I use a lot of tools but I never use the mortar and pestle um, it's just Where a great <laughs> symbol for me of using your hands and working with your hands and the power of that. And so I don't believe that you need anything special. And actually throughout the making, you know, like I said in the first episode, I brought my knives to Italy. And after that, I just left them at home and we used whatever people had because it wasn't about that special tool. It was about 
Dona Conchi's like broken old blender and whatever, you know, because you don't need the fancy stuff to make something good. Right. And if I was showing up with my like fancy micro plane grater in the, you know, rural Yucatan, it wasn't necessarily like true to the message. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Now, did you travel with the mortar and pestle? <laughs> we travel, I bought a, bu I bulk, I hoarded several in Italy <laughs> and sent them home with Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're diplomatic pouch. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got one in the in the cabin, and I'm gonna I'm gonna drag it out, Great. I think, and, and try to use it a little more regularly. But the blender is really does for me what the yeah. Um, yeah. One of, another one of the uh, great things about the the acid uh, episode was the salsa, and just talking talking about. <laughs> Okay, so what's the story behind this salsa? <laughs> it was just really spicy. <laughs> and the, as I said, you have to do things multiple times when you're shooting. And so I sort of was having a meta experience of eating the spiciest thing that I'd ever eaten and having tears come up while knowing that I would have to do it many more times for the camera. <laughs> but I think you only did it once because you touched your eye, which then became oh, inflamed. that's right. I think that's oh my God. <laughs> Like she was not acting. Was yeah. <laughs> um, well, listen. Thank you so much for joining us here today, both of you. Was uh, and you know, the show is bound to be a huge success because I've already passed it on to three people. Thank, thank you, you know, so nice. much. Thank you for watching. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes. Really delightful. <laughs>